Today we make a transition to a very different place in the course. Uh, you've now gotten your two major building blocks down, which are act requirements and mens rea. You've learned the essentials of uh, statutory interpretation, and you've learned a lot about the background policy issues like punishment theory and the scope of criminalization. And now we're going to apply those tools, especially the latter or the first two, act requirement mens rea, the first two I listed, not the first two in the book. And we'll do that over and over and over for each chapter until we get to the very last about general affirmative defenses. We will touch on affirmative defenses at the end of this chapter and at the end of the conspiracy chapter, but for the most part, we're now going to repeat the formula that I laid out earlier this semester, which is act requirements mens rea, sometimes affirmative defenses, act requirements mens rea. And so you see that right away with the tenth, right? We're going to start with our act requirements here. We're going to look at them both under a common law approach and an NPC approach, because there is a difference here. Not going to be true in every chapter, but it is true here. So you need to have these conceptual categories uh, down in order to be able to, to do the work of these chapters and to understand uh, the material. Okay, so what, what is attempt? Well, attempt is an inchoate crime, an incomplete crime. The defendant has not completed the result. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that can be true for a couple different reasons, right? That could be because they were apprehended uh, before the crime is committed or stopped in some other way if it's not the police. Or they could have actually tried to do everything and failed miserably. So let's say they had six bullets and a gun, they tried to shoot and kill somebody, and they all missed, or say one hit, but the person survived. So the result of death that we associate with a homicide uh, did not occur. So yeah, that's, that seems uh, still serious, right? But it's not the same, right? It's how do we make this... In, how do these incomplete crimes be charged? And of course, you have some obvious intuitions and general pop culture knowledge here. But I, I don't think you, you probably have the, the distinctions that the laws draw in mind, because it turns out that the way our law defines attempt is, and it is going to vary based on the approach of you know common law, NBC. But it also is, it's a very tricky endeavor to differentiate attempt from what we might call, or what is called, preparation. Preparation is not criminal, right? So you can prepare for a crime, it's only when you attempt it, it becomes criminal. But of course that begs the question, what is the line dividing these two? So I, I use an example, which is um, you know not too long ago for, for you all, um, hopefully it's not too painful a memory, um, which is uh, the LSAT, right? You probably, hopefully, prepared for the LSAT, right? you have LSAT prep course. Um, and we might wonder, well, what was the moment in time you attempted the LSAT, right? Was it when you signed up and paid the fee, right? Was that the attempt? Was it when you bought number two pencils or got materials that you were going to bring to the, the testing site? Was it when you arrived at the testing site on that day? Was it when you actually sat down at the desk? Or was it when you completed the first problem, right? Something, somewhere there was a magic line between preparation and attempt, but it turns out there's arguments for a lot of different places in time. And so what our criminal law is focused at is, well, let's try to draw a line that's consistent. It will apply across all crimes because attempt can modify you know, any other crime. It will be attempted something. It's not just attempted bad or attempted no good. It's attempted homicide, attempted kidnapping, attempted burglary, attempted theft. So it's always linked to the completion of a crime. Now, the LSAT isn't a crime, but you still have the same thought process. What moment in time did you attempt it? Well, there's two general ways we might think about this problem. Uh, one would be a, a sort of backward-looking test to see what you've already done. Right? In other words, we pick one of those spots in time and we say, what are all the steps that you've taken? And at some point, we might imagine an accumulation of steps will create an attempt. So it's a backward-in-time-looking test. We say, at this moment, where say you were apprehended, what have you done? What is it that um, you know, you've know you done and is that sufficient for it to be an attempt? Uh, in sort of the opposite direction, we have a forward-looking test that says, what do you have left to do? Right, Not so much what you've done, but how close are you? So in the slide here is somebody just outside of a home carrying what looks like a burglar's toolkit ready to go in there. Right? It's, it's not about what they've done, it's about well the fact that they're right there and they're gonna commit the crime in just a matter of minutes. And so these are two conceptual ways of thinking of attempt, and as I'll talk about in a minute, this is actually the, the basic difference between the MPC and common law, but not the entirety of the differences between them. Um, and the, the rule that both jurisdictions use, or the label for the rule, uh, to say when preparation crosses into attempt is the overt act requirement. So the overt act 
is what says, oh, you're no longer preparing, you are now attempting the crime. Uh, so our dog here is uh, in a, a uh, backward looking test would say, well, he's done 5% of what needs to be done. And a forward looking test, well, he's still got 95% to go if we could quantitatively nail it down from a escape from, from doggy prison. Okay, so what is the common law approach? It is that um, forward looking test. It's a, it focuses on proximity to the completion of the crime. Um, I've always liked this ridiculous meme to embody it. It may not work for you, but the idea is that there has to be real danger. You know, the crime is almost completed. Um, the proximity is a little ambiguous as to whether it's physical proximity, if we're still counting steps and so it's the percentage proximity to completion, um, or maybe temporal proximity, how much time is left completion. All of those can be considered. The law doesn't necessarily dictate one or the other, but you'll see in the Rizzo case, physical proximity was a very important consideration. Um, and so I always imagine the guy watching water balloon toss. This is, this is when we've attempted the water balloon toss because the intensity is so there. Um, yeah, I guess it's actually the receipt is there because the toss is completed. It's, it's almost receiving it if that were a crime. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the common law approach. Uh, what, what, let's look at cases. Let's, let's talk about how the law is applied here. So uh, People versus Rizzo is an older case here. I have mentioned in the last section that I don't like to use older cases, but this is again an important to use the older case to see the traditional approach that's taught, I think, in most every law school, and Rizzo's the case often do it. But then I like to show a modern case about how this traditional rule, even in common law jurisdictions, is being softened somewhat and being made a little more prosecutor friendly, because this seems like a not an ideal rule if you're concerned about law enforcement. I guess that would be the most generous way to put it. Um, so yeah, these aren't actually uh, the four people in our crime here. Instead, we have four uh, former Lakers uh, who are all just cruising around town. Um, the reason I think they should you know, embody what's going on well is apparently these four people were so conspicuous um, that they got apprehended before they'd even gotten to where they were gonna commit their crime. Right? They, their goal here was to rob Charles Rao of payroll assets and receipts, and so uh, they have to find him, and they can't. So they're just driving around, they're all armed uh, in the city of New York, and they get pulled over. Um, you know, they confess as to what they've done, they're prosecuted, they're convicted, but the court overturns here and says, no, no, they have not actually attempted the crime because they weren't dangerously close or very near its completion, right? And so dangerously close and very near are two different sort of phrases that are used for the proximity test. Um, the court here even verse, you know, but cites some other common law tradition, like going back to England, there must be a dangerous proximity to success. The particular language used doesn't seem to matter much. It's just courts use different language to embody this overt act that is a proximity test. And the court says, if you can't find the person and that's the target, well, how could you be dangerously close to completion? And that sounds right, but it does present some oddities, right? First of all, it encourages law enforcement to be reactive instead of proactive, meaning that the officers here prevented what could have been a very serious and deadly crime, but it, under this rule, they're more or less being told, well, no, you gotta wait next time. You gotta wait until they actually find Charles Rao and maybe have your guns drawn, and, and that creates a little more danger um, sometimes. Um, but also, it really rewards these defendants because they had a particular target, which seems kind of strange. Right? If we imagined instead, that they were driving around just looking for someone, you know, to rob, and the cops got aboard. Well, there was always somebody near them, right? Or if they were in an alley laying, laying in wait for just somebody to pass by, and no one had until the cops. Um, again, it just because Charles Rao was their particular target, they're rewarded. If they were more generalized in their criminality, uh, the conviction can be upheld. And that seems strange. What is it about a, uh, targeting a particular person that makes us think uh, this is not somebody who should be prosecuted and convicted? Like the jurors uh, seemed supportive of this. So there are other uh, concerns about this rule as well, but it's very prosecutor unfriendly, right? It's much more defendant friendly than the NPC. And it's because it is forward looking, and it's forward looking in a way that really focuses on this dangerous proximity. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is our, our traditional rule. It's still followed pretty well in most jurisdictions, but we do see some softening. And what I mean by softening is the prosecution can meet it a little bit easier than maybe they used to. And the Swigert case is a good illustration of this. Um, you know, here we have uh, conduct uh, by our defendant uh, that, you know, many of you may look at and just say, oh, that sounds creepy, right? That sounds weird. 
uh, an older person, an older man, communicating with a small child here known as Eddie um, and inviting him back to his house to play. You know, again, this, you know, jets, choo-choo trains. But what's there's a couple things here that, that might make us wonder. It's just, we don't actually have a clear idea of what Swiger is planning, right? I guess, you know, the abduction charge is the, the basic one here because that assumes that he's going to take control of him and and even if he doesn't bind him, he will hold him in a place. And the court thinks that at least there's that. It would be able, it would be impossible to say this was a child murder or child sex abuse because there's just there's evidence not pointing there. But the child abduction even is is tricky. Um, I mean, let's consider the facts that we have here. We have the overture, but it's not clear that our defendant actually wanted Eddie alone. We can read it that way, but it's not definitive. Um, there's also sometimes adults that you know, developmentally are, you know, themselves uh, sort of trapped in this sort of child's frame of mind. And, and you know, this is not unheard of. I'm not saying that's what's happening here. I'm saying that the evidence doesn't give us an obvious answer because one of the things that's strained here is the defendant did leave, right? He wasn't apprehended. Uh, he wasn't caught by the, the mom here. He just scurried off away. And so, yeah, that, that raises more questions about what was going to happen next, right? What was his plan? And of course, you might again look at some of the other evidence here as the court did and say, well, that seems like there's a lot going on. I mean, he has an unloaded handgun. It's unloaded. It's a gun, not just illegal. Ten throwing stars, a machete. Okay, a lot of weapons, right? But for abduction, it's not clear why those are as important in the van. A cannabis pipe, so he, he smokes pot, but that again, so I know. Children's toys, lingerie, wigs, sex toys, and restraint devices. Now, restraint devices may be, I think, the most important here, but the court throws in all this other stuff because I think they're they're judging the character of our defendant more than they're really saying this evidence is indicative of anything, right? The fact that he has lingerie, maybe he wears it, maybe it's someone else's, but the court's throwing it out there as though it tells us something. It's not clear why that would be needed for a child's abduction at all. Wigs? Sex toys, again, uh, there's a lot to create sort of this creepiness feeling uh, among uh, the reader, but saying that it's strongly there for an abduction, well, you know, uh, look at our Rizzo case, right? They couldn't find Charles Rao. They were not guilty. In this case, our defendant did find Eddie, but he left. And he didn't, we didn't see evidence that he was ever going to try to restrain him. This may have been an entirely um, consensual, voluntary uh, arrangement that, that our defendant had in mind, and when he got a, a no and rebuffed, he walked away. And so, yeah, how can we uphold the conviction? Well, that's why I'm, I'm you know, emphasizing why these facts are, are, you know, not necessarily crystal clear, because under the Rizzo rule, I think this conviction should be overturned. Now, the court says otherwise. The court says, oh, no, even under the traditional common law rule, we would still reach the same outcome. I think that's dicey, and in fact, there's other, especially earlier cases in the 20th century uh, where defendants had done far more, like actually gotten a child into their car, um, and you know and they were unknown strangers, and their convictions were overturned. So Swigert did far less than that in terms of you know completion of the act, that forward-looking, dangerous proximity. Uh, but you'll notice the court does something maybe a little odd here. Um, they start talking about the model penal code. The model penal code is not in play in Illinois in terms of men's right. It's just not. But what the court's trying to use it for here is not to cite it as, as uh, statutory authority. Well, they couldn't in any jurisdiction because it's never statutory authority. You'd cite the state statute. They're citing it to show that our understanding of attempt has changed over time. And they've incorporated that into sort of persuasive authority. In other words, the NPC was onto something here, right? They were backward looking. They were focused on these substantial steps, and this is why the case is a nice segue to our next section on the NPC approach. They go through portions of the NPC here, again, something that has no applicability in Illinois. But the court's saying, you know, maybe we this dangerous proximity of tasks needs to be lowered just a little bit, right? And to focus on some of the things the defendant has done, right? In other words, the evidence that's in the car uh, we can incorporate better through this sort of substantial step analysis of the model penal code. Now, not every jurisdiction in every court is going to do this for, I think, obvious reasons, right? The NPC is not incorporated in Illinois law, so why should it be um, analyzed? Why should it take up a large segment of this opinion? On the other hand, there is a pragmatism of some courts that say, you know, this Rizzo rule that we've been sitting on for a long time seems to be letting a lot of dangerous people out let's update it a little, right? And if the legislature thinks we're wrong, they can fix it, but we'll be a little more proactive here. 
And so, yeah, I think this is a case that should come out differently in a traditional Rizzo common law rule. But Swigert represents a modern approach you sometimes see. It's not going full board on the NPC. It's not saying they're using substantial step. It's not saying they, they're going to use the list of things that constitute a substantial step that we'll talk about in a minute. But they are changing the dangerous proximity test and how it's understood. And courts do at least have some latitude here because legislatures often don't define what attempt is with detail. The dangerous proximity test is, you know, part of the language used to the statute, but the courts can interpret that in a, a way that maybe isn't the same as Rizzo. Um, the fact that they use the model penal code to get them there might be a little unusual, but I think Swiger is becoming more and more typical, um, not the reasoning, but the outcome. In other words, they are willing to say you don't have to be as close as finding Charles Rao, having your guns pulled and being ready to rob him. Instead, you can have situations like this. And so this is an expanse of our attempt law under the common law. Okay, well, what about under the NPC? Well, we already got the nice preview from the Swiger case, and uh, but I, you know, gave you a fuller version of the whoops, uh, fuller version of the NPC approach by combining two statutes, the Oklahoma and Connecticut statute. Um, and this is just because I wanted to to get close to what the original NPC says, and it just happened that cobbling together two statutes was the best way to go. Um, so, what is the Oklahoma statute? A person is guilty of attempt to commit a crime if acting the kind of culpability otherwise required for the commission of the, the crime. We'll get to that in the mens rea section, because that's what's saying. We have to look at both the mens rea rule for the underlying crime and for our attempt uh, um, a rule that applies across all crimes. And so we'll get to how they handle the mens rea. And so it says, purposely engages in um, conduct which would constitute the offense of the attendant circumstances through the belief, and B, when causing a particular result of the crime, does anything with the purpose of causing the belief with the cause or, or such a result without further conduct as part. So the Oklahoma statute here is defining our mens rea rule. So we'll get to that in our next section, but I want to give you the complete rundown of uh, the statute, statutory approach of the MPC. And so to decide if something is a crime, the overt act requirement of the MPC is substantial step, meaning substantial step had to be completed, and that's what creates the overt act, and that's what makes preparation cross into attempt. And so we see this defined in the Connecticut statute. Conduct shall not be held to be constitute a substantial step unless it is strongly corroborative of the actor's criminal purpose. Now, sometimes students want to just jump into the one through seven and skip over this part. Um, our first case, Leonard, you, you want to keep this in mind uh, in our discussion. Not just so much in the high court opinion, but when we discuss maybe why the lower court would have reached a different outcome here. Um, meaning that it can't just be substantial steps of doing something wrong. It has to connect it back to the crime and the mens rea. And I'll, we'll talk about examples of this further in class, but the general idea is you can't just some, find somebody with a bunch of stuff that seems to be up to no good, like they have duct tape, they have a gun, um, they have a, a drugs, you know, you can get them for the possession, but what, what else is, what does that mean, right? That's all in their trunk. They have a crowbar, you can't just charge them, as I said earlier, with attempted bad. It has to be attempted a particular crime. So that's what that language is about there. Without negating the sufficiency of other conduct, the following, if strongly corroborative of an actor's criminal purpose, shall not shall be not be held insufficient as a matter of law. So, you know, there were two double negatives in these uh, intro sentences, but hopefully you've got the general meaning here. So this list here is not an exhaustive list but it is very helpful uh, for the NPC drafters to have provided these, because this gives you seven things that automatically constitute substantial steps. Other things might as well, but once you have this list of seven, you, you get the general idea here. Of what is um, causing preparation to become attempt? So I'm gonna walk through each and give you a little information about some of them in greater detail. Lying in wait, searching or following the contemplated victim of the crime. So either waiting for them to show up at a place, if it's a interpersonal crime, or um, um, following them um, to commit that crime. Two, enticing or seeking to entice the contemplated victim at a time to go to the place contemplated versus commission. So take a little more step of saying, meet me at so-and-so place, right? Or say, why don't you come with me and we'll go down this dark alley together and no, no, don't worry, I won't do anything wrong. Those would be enticing or seeking to entice the contemplated victim. Three is recon. This one can be quite broad for some crimes, right? So if you case a, a store, right? In other words, robbery, that means survey it, observe their hours, observe who works there when they shut down. That's all recon, that's an attempt. This is, this is much, much broader than our common law, even under Swiger, and certainly under Rizzo, right? The Rizzo defendants have committed, you know, the recon once they identified Charles Rao as their particular victim because they knew he had the payroll. That's enough, 
They didn't even have to get into the car with their guns. They had attempted it the moment they'd gathered that intelligence and decided on a particular victim. Very different approach here, because it is backward looking, and it's looking at what they've done already, not what they have left to do. Unlawful entry of a structure, vehicle, or enclosure in which is contemplated the crime will be committed. So yeah, if you are unlawfully in a house, a parking garage, inside a vehicle, and you're waiting for the crime to be committed, that's also going to trigger a substantial step. Five and six are sometimes confused, and we want to make sure we separate them because they are different. Possession of materials to be employed in the commission of the crime, which are specifically designed for such unlawful use or which can serve no lawful purpose of the actor under the circumstances. What we're talking about here is things that are inherently criminal, right? Things that just there's no lawful purpose and they're connected to the crime. A good example is a lock picking set. Unless you are a locksmith, having a lock picking set is something that's not generally legal and is considered to indicate unlawful use. Having a poison, right? Even one that's legal um, in general, but it's something that you know you had to acquire through special means, say that you you know acted as a front for a pharmacy to acquire it. So it's it's unlawful for you to have. Uh, in those cases. That is something alone that can be a substantial step. It still has to be corroborative of the criminal purpose, but these sorts of illegalities, and then there's more obvious ones, like if you have a nuclear bomb or things that just aren't allowed anywhere, well, that's that's an easy call. But I was trying to give you some that are more borderline or, or you understand the threshold, like lockpicks or illegally acquired substances um, that it might be legal for some people to have, like doctors, pharmacists, veterinarians, wherever you, you pretend to be, but not everyone. Okay, then what is six? Possession, collection, or fabrication materials to be employed in the commission of the crime at or near the place contemplated for commission where such possession, collection, or fabrication serves no lawful purpose of the actor under the circumstances. Well, here we can deal with things that are legal for anyone to have, but indicate criminality when, uh, you know, at a particular location. Um, so things like duct tape I mentioned earlier, right? Anyone can buy duct tape. But if you bring up a tape to a meeting for somebody, well, that starts to be weird. And if you also have rope and you also have um, a, a bag that, you know, is bound with them and on the outside it's marked people only or something, you know, you can add up whatever fact you here. But if they're lawfully possessed items, but they're not, but where they are, where they're located in relation to where the crime is being committed is important. Um, and so guns can fit under here, right? Guns which are lawfully owned, which are protected under our, our Second Amendment rights acknowledged in Heller, can be indicative of a substantial step if they're brought to a location that indicates that criminality. What about D, solicit an innocent agent, I mean seven, sorry, um, numbers versus letters. Uh, solicit an innocent agent to engage in conduct constituting an element of the offense. It means asking someone else to join you. And so this is pretty important uh, under the MPC because it includes any time a crime uh, it's going to involve multiple people. If one of them asks the other, that was an attempt. Um, so involving another person alone can be a substantial step. Uh, so this is, as I said, much, much broader just from this list, but there can be other things that aren't here as well. Okay, so let's look at a case, uh, Linhart. Now, Linhart's kind of a strange case, and I like it uh, because it, it forces you to think, well, how could anyone have thought differently here? Because as we know here, they're actually reversing the intermediate court. So that's one of the things I want you to think about in class. Because it seems like there's a lot of evidence here that this defendant is guilty. Right? She is trying to build a pipe bomb, which is a, you know, relatively easy explosive to build, but not super easy. I mean, it's not like you're building a complex trigger um, for a nuclear device, which you know somebody can't put together. But this is a person who's got some information off the web, which you can find. And it requires ingredients that are generally well available, but putting it together can be a little tricky. But one of the things that we have tons of here is mens rea evidence. So, I, you know, it's helpful to get that out of the way and recognize that even though there's strong evidence that what she wants to do, right, she wants to get revenge on these people that she, you know, prison guards that she associates with, you know, her past incarceration and... She's, you know, and she wants to get police. And, I mean, she's saying she wants to kill two pigs. She's going to use these pipe bombs. She specifically wants to go after, after this um, female officer named Shelly. I mean, and she's telling everyone this, right? She's creating an evidence trail everywhere. Now, but it's important to see that that evidence, lots of that evidence, only fits in our men's right category. It's about her mental state and what she's trying to do. The attempt itself, we have to look at, under the NPC, what substantial steps has she taken? And if we walk through our list, you know, certainly if she had an assembled pipe bomb, 
that would fit under our, our sub five, right? She would unlawful have something that's inherently unlawful. Um, this might fit under sub six, although she hasn't brought it to the seat of anywhere. It actually doesn't fit our list super perfectly, but it, it, it's close on a couple categories. Um, but it's still a lot of conduct, right? She has the ingredients here. She has the instructions. Uh, the police also found materials for making false identification cards, a defendant's driver's license, falsified birth certificate, an application for a new social security card, and a falsified high school transcript. In other words, after she commits these crimes, it seems like she's going to disappear. And she's done that. So these are even, you know, they're not, they're related, in the, you know, to, at the periphery of what the crime is. Um, you know, the only thing that's missing, according to the detective, that the defendant possessed everything required for a pipe bomb except a completed switch, and that switch could possibly be made from wire found at the scene or a clothes blend, which the defendant had tried to acquire for her friend. Yeah, I mean, that seems like if we're backward looking, there's a lot here. But we might wonder, why did the other... I think this is the right outcome, by the way. I just want you to think, how could any court have reached uh, the opposite? But importantly, this case should be an overturned conviction, not even a prosecution, under the common law rule. Right? Look at the Rizzo rule compared to Linhart. Rizzo, they couldn't find Charles Rao. That's the end of the day. Here, she never even makes a move to go to her victims um, because she hasn't completed the bomb. And under the traditional common law rule, the court would say, that's not dangerously close. You're not very near. There's no pro dangerous proximity met. And so this is just considered mere preparation, which is not criminal. So this is a case that really highlights the, the extreme difference between the common law and the model penal code. So that's it for our act requirements, which are often more important in most cases than our mens rea for attempt, uh, because we, especially under the common law. The MPC, well, the, the mens rea becomes more important because it's often quite easy to meet the act requirements. But a lot of our cases, you really need to focus on the act requirements in a, a different way um, than you're used to, right? In the past, you focused on just the statutory language and voluntariness and little, little tidbits like omissions and, and possession. But here, we're now breaking down the conduct and seeing if it's enough, if it's enough to say that a criminal attempt has occurred. So that's it for the act requirements. We'll next talk about mens rea for attempt.